Thanks, man. <clears throat> Boy, we, uh, I had a great day yesterday. Um, hey, thank you folks for joining us today. I'm trying to get organized here. There's so much. I like this guy, Andrew Saul. Listen to this, he's a PhD. Healing is too big a topic for any one person to know it all. He's right. You know, I don't know it all. Doctors don't know it all. Then he says doctors frequently get it wrong. One in five patients today in a hospital is in a hospital because incorrect treatment by a physician put him or her there. I disagree. I personally think the numbers are a little higher, but at least here's a PhD saying this. Good health makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't make a lot of dollars. What I try and teach you here is not to avoid medical care. Folks, sometimes, look, if, you're, if you follow the standard American diet, what's the acronym? S-A-D. If you follow the standard American diet and last night you had a bowl of ice cream before you went to bed and uh, you, you drank beer, you know, a glass of wine, I'm telling you it's not a bad idea to get a colonoscopy. It's not a bad idea to go through routine physicals. Um, but if you're veering from that the way I did many, oh, come on, I'll have a bowl of ice cream from time to time. Don't touch alcohol. But, um, you know, I, I began studying mycotoxins. Fungi make poisons called mycotoxins. I finally found a couple of brilliant researchers uh, who sat down, a couple of men, who sat down and conversed about things. And folks, they touched on things. Uh, the, the younger one, you know, babbled a little bit, but still the information is important. Um, they talk about sugar. Is any okay? They talk about peanuts. Peanuts are pretty commonly contaminated with mycotoxins. They talk about things that, that gosh, so much younger than I am, and I'm an old guy, and here are a couple of young guys sitting here. They can say the word mycotoxin. They can say the word sugar and how much is okay. I'll tell you what, uh, John, go to that and let's show the public uh, what's going on with these guys. peanuts and mycotoxin, but only when you grow up, when you're like, a, when you're like, when you grow up to be a uh, adult, um, like a big kid, or like me, or a grown up, then, you, then you'll be allowed to eat peanuts but and mycotoxins, but not all the times, and not not a lot of times. Just in moderation. This in moderation. Yeah. This in moderation. You can eat them. But not all the times. You get sick and die. But you still eat sugar and not all the time. I don't know No. Okay, oh, he's got it. I think he understands. Yeah, he understands. <laughs> when uh, Katie sent that to my wife and I this morning, we just rolled. Five-year-old Berkeley knows about mycotoxins. They impregnate peanut, corn, wheat, uh, grain, rice. Um, and folks, that's the epicenter of my uh, show. And then I love, yeah, mom, in moderation, you know, in moderation. Anything in moderation except moderation itself. Um, and then he dwelled the brilliance of this boy, five years old. Then he dwells on uh, sugar. Eh, it's okay, a little bit, you know, in moderation, but, but not a lot. And I love when he said, uh, you know, peanuts are okay for adults, uh, but not for kids, uh, big boys like me. I am so, yesterday, my wife and I drove mm, nine hours, four and a half back and forth, just to squeeze those guys, just to see those guys. Uh, and we had so much fun and we ended up eating at Whole Foods Market because we were just scattered. The kids were going one way with their kids and we were going another way. And uh, so we met at Whole Foods uh, probably five o'clock in the evening. And Whole Foods has, Behind a counter there in Austin, they have uh, pears and oranges and bananas for kids. And that little Rex guy walks up and he, he bites into a banana, banana and he takes it, hey, dada, you know, and then he bites into an orange. And <laughs> we saw this little sign, one per child, please. He's taking a bite out of pears and apples and so forth. I, uh, 
uh, you know, I'd gladly pay for those. Um, folks, as I open today's show, if indeed I'm right, if indeed mold, mildew, fungus, and Berkeley, mycotoxins. If mycotoxins, which are poisons made by fungi and end up in products that we eat, uh, like our beef supply, our corn supply, our wheat supply, our peanut supply, uh, sugar then fuels. You see, in a human fungal relationship, fungus it becomes the dominant cell. I'm telling you this, it's true. Dr. Elizabeth Moore Landacker published that, a mycologist. And she contends then, as the dominant cell, push the human cell away, dictate to it what's going on. Fungi thrive in a rich sugar environment. So all of a sudden, yeah, you've got migraines, you've got menstrual problems, you've got itchy skin or depression, or your ears itch so bad, or your toes, or your knees hurt when you get up in the morning. But folks, you find yourself, and you don't know why, worse, your doctor has no idea, why you're craving sugar. Oh, come on, in your sock drawer, you've got a couple of Hershey bars, you know, in the refrigerator, well, that's right, I bought that half gallon of ice cream for the kids, they're never gonna eat it, so I'll... I've made those excuses too. Um, you can't help it. Sugar dictates your body temperature. Sure, fungi can cause a febrile situation, a fever. The doctors believe only bacteria does. Trust me when I tell you, fungal infections can raise body temp also. Fungi love it at 102 degrees, like it at 98.6 degrees. Um, so it, it, it's just, it, it strikes me as odd that doctors don't know this, but that's okay, because we're gonna continue marching down this trail till we get it right. If fungi induce uh, numerous health symptoms and health problems, diseases, then products like I talk about here, here's Optivita, with their curcumin, with their hemp, with their topical hemp, with their meal replacement. I love their, uh, I don't know if you saw these packets, but um, Complete Essentials. Just open it, put it in a glass of water. Um, John swears, and I would tend to agree, this totally took him out of a situation where he was getting sick, uh, and uh, I totally, I totally believe it would do that. OptivitaHealth.com. Products like these folks really work. As a matter of fact, in my notes, I've got to read you something here. <clears throat> here it is. I sent away two bottles of this, aloe vera. Um, and I talked to Sarge. By the way, John, on my drive home the other night, I called him and, and uh, he thanked me uh, for giving away a couple of bottles. And uh, he's such a nice man. Uh, his name is uh, Dwayne Hughes. He lives in California. He's 73 years old, and he started a company about 70 years old, and he's been advertising with us. Um, he and his wife, Sharon, amazing couple. Uh, he sent me this testimonial. He gets so many of these, i got to read it to you. My name is Ron. I live in Smithton, Missouri. I just wanted to put in a good word for your product, Aloe Apex. I've been on your product for about a month and have taken digestive problems. I've had digestive problems for the last 15 years, a lot of digestive enzymes, minimal results. Got on the aloe apex and within a week to 10 days, I started to notice tremendous difference. I was never able to digest beans and other foods. They always gave me a lot of gas, bloating, etc. The aloe apex has made a tremendous difference in anyone. If anyone has given a thought to trying this product uh, before, absolutely try it now. You can't believe the difference in your body. Uh, thank you, thank your product and God bless you all. Uh, signed Ron. Um, the product, Aloe Apex, I'm kind of tempted. Man, my, my bill of shipping is going up, up, up. I'm kind of tempted to give away a couple of more, one to our Facebook group and one to our YouTube group. So let's do that. I'll send people with tummy problems that have been through the mill. And folks, I read all of your, uh, there was a hundred of them or so, all of your questions the other night when I got home. Um, how I wish I could send everybody. It's, it's for sale, it's not expensive. Uh, but I wish I could send you all a free bottle. Everyone could try that. I think you'd realize how good that is. Uh, can I talk for a few minutes? What I really wanted to do is talk about um, an art article that came out and just blew my mind. U.S. fertility rate falls to all-time low, the Center for Disease Control said. 
the general fertility rate in the United States, and by the way, not just U.S., other countries, continues to decline year after year, according to a new study at the uh, World Health or uh, by the World Health Organization. Nationwide report found that general fertility rates dropped 2 percent between 2017 and 2018 among girls and women age 15, I hope they drop, girls age 15, to 45 nationally. Total fertility rate, um, it, so it's going down, down, down. And you know what's funny? I got to thinking about this. Uh, I worked in a clinic one time where the senior doctor left, a really nice female doctor, uh, internal medicine, and she went off and started with a couple other uh, of her partners a fertility clinic. And I'm telling you, the money flows. You're 27 years old. You just got married. You don't have money. You drive a Volkswagen, right, or ride a bicycle, and but you really want a baby. I understand this. Uh, and then you figure out after six months of trying, it ain't gonna happen. You must be infertile. Uh, and uh, you'll spend, borrow from mom and dad, in lieu of buying a home with that $30,000 deposit, you give it to a fertility specialist. And there are fertility specialists all over. Do you remember when I read you the list, we won't put it up, but I read you the list of all the problems induced or caused by mycotoxins. Berkeley told you about one today. Um, one of them was mycotoxins become endocrine disruptors. What is diabetes? What is menopause? What is PMS? What's wrong with my endocrine system? By the way, endocrine systems are systems that have hormones that they regulate, right? What's diabetes? This is a problem when you're infertile. 90% uh, of it leans on women. I don't know why that is. Even this article, you know, women, 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 women. Your eggs aren't working. You can't, uh, you know, have a baby. Nobody shakes their finger at men. And I did an article for TV. I did a, oh, probably a five or six minute segment here not long ago. You haven't seen it yet, I don't think, right, John? They probably haven't seen this yet. Nope. Okay. In, uh, in 2018, the medical journal Toxicology, oh, look at all my text. The medical journal Toxicology, you know what that is? Poison. Can you imagine a medical journal called Poison? Toxicology reported on, reported on the poisoning effect of aflatoxin B1, a mycotoxin made by aspergillus mold, and its effect on sperm. So aspergillus is, I think, next to penicillium, the most common fungi out there. And penicillium and aspergillus have many kids. So there's Aspergillus fumigatus, Aspergillus niger, Aspergillus, and there's many penicillins also. Okay, they titled their paper, Aflatoxin B1 Impairs Sperm Quality and Fertilization Competence. This was written 2018, a journal Toxicology. Aflatoxin B1, Aspergillus mold, which is in many ducting systems, I would guess most in America. Aspergillus, which Berkeley <laughs> tried to affect you or, or educate you on, is in corn. It's in our wheat supply. It's in peanuts. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it's a very widespread mycotoxin, but it's not rare. And here it says aflatoxin B1 impairs sperm quality and fertilization competence. The sperm don't work. It's not the egg. Egg's happy to meet sperm. Sperm's not working. Okay, but there's more as I did this. I'm reading these articles out of PubMed or other journals that I uh, get. In 2017, a Chinese andrology medical journal, that's the study of men's uh, disorders, published a different mycotoxin, this one called Acrotoxin A, affects the function of male reproductive system by acting as an endocrine disruptor. You're gonna hear those two words often, folks. If you're suffering from a health problem, you're probably suffering from an endocrine disruption. Wait a minute, Doug. Beta cells, islet cells in my pancreas, a, a byproduct of those are beta cells, and beta cells make insulin. What dysregulates those? Mycotoxins. How do I know? If you inject 
a couple of mycotoxins. One of them is called baphylomyosin, baphylomyosin, B-A-F-I-L-O, baphylomyosin, or streptozotocin, uh, inoculate bunnies. They all get diabetes. M bunnies don't get diabetes unless we inoculate them with these things. So we know that diabetes is a mold problem. Mold makes a poison. Mold makes... It. One thing I read, I'll tell you about that in a second, about the effect of antibiotics. Women, if you're on birth control pills and you're taking penicillin, just hold off for a minute, okay? Okay, so there's a different. This is a Chinese andrology medical uh, paper. came out August 23rd, 2017. Aquatoxin A, I know about this, I'll teach you a little bit about, affects the function of the male reproductive system by acting as an endocrine disruptor. The sperm don't swim. It is also a testicular toxin and known to decrease sperm quality. That's two of them. There's a thousand of them they found so far. You know, in writing this men's book, John, I am having, by the way, Mike and I met, we are having a ball writing this book. Can't wait to read it. The women's book, you know, really has done so well. Thank you. It's going to take off and be one of these bestsellers. The men's book is from my perspective. The women's book was so difficult from my perspective. I had to go on raw data, science, what science says about menstruation. I don't know, but here's what science says. PMS. I'll never forget on the radio one time. I decided to do my opening 10 minutes. I had a one hour live show. And I decided to uh, do my opening 10 minutes on something out of my field, PMS, premenstrual syndrome. And a woman called and she said, Doug, what do you do for PMS? And I said, I go bowling. <laughs> really simple. And she laughed, as everyone did, and said, no, no, what can I do about it? And I realized, folks, 30 years ago, I wasn't equipped to talk about endocrine disruption. When you're endocrine, when you're hormone producing every gland in your body, when your hormone producing system doesn't work, you make an appointment with what? An endocrinologist who knows that much about bacteria, that much about virus, and that much about endocrine disruption due to fungus and mycotoxins. But it's real. So if I, ha guys, if you're watching me right now and you're young and you want to start a family, I can't tell you how many times I have given lectures, Kyle or John or one of the guys would go with me throughout this great country of ours and we'd get in my old pickup truck and we'd drive, we'd have books in the back of the truck, people wanted to buy them, that's great. It never covered, you know, the books, I don't know how much they were, 20, 30 bucks, it never covered our night stay, you know, hotel, gas. But it was always great to sign books and meet the people. I can't tell you how many couples came up to me and asked me if I would hold their baby and if they could take a picture. Because the diet was responsible for that baby. Um, boy, I have so many stories I could tell you about this. We blame the women because we're men. But most often, I believe, it's motility. If sperm don't swim, they're not going to hit an egg. It's really that simple. And, and mycotoxins affect that. So my, my final graphic on this on television, you'll see this again. How are we men exposed to aflatoxin B1 and aquatoxin A? Especially in our cereal grains. If we eat cereal in the morning or toast, especially in our grains, corn, rice, wheat. But also these mycotoxins impregnate coffee beans and alcohols like wine and beer. Dried fr fruits can also expose men to these fungal poisons. My point is they're not rare, nor is infertility. You know, here's our medical field. Well, diabetes is going up at astronomic rates. Uh, infertility, astronomic cancer, oh, it's just horrible what we're seeing. Uh, okay, next patient. Why fix it? You work in the golden goose. You're being rewarded basically for not knowing a cause. That's good. I never set out to figure out uh, these disorders. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. But when you begin, let me just read you a couple of things. This is so much fun as I dug through this. By the way, as I was digging through my notes, my old diabetes, I wrote a book on diabetes 
the fungus linked to diabetes um, was the book. Initially, when it came out 15, 17 years ago, the title was Infectious Diabetes. If fungi, if ringworm is infectious, uh, then diabetes, also a yeast or a mold problem, is also uh, infectious. I changed the name to the fungus linked to diabetes because nobody got my humor. As I'm doing this study on diabetes, um, and, and the numbers, folks, they're so, for me, it's tragic because um, where they put these billboards, these bulletins, um, diabetes is a major, here you go, the hidden cause of the deadly diabetes epidemic and dozens of other health conditions. You know, diabetes is a deadly health problem. Gosh, I don't know how to shut that off. Diabetes is a deadly health problem that's crushing not only the health of millions, but also straining the healthcare system to a breaking point. 10% uh, of all medical spending, and what's, what is it, four trillion now? They're pushing for five, but four trillion? Thanks, John. Um, oh, that's, God bless you, John, that's great. Thank you, Martine. Um, ten, I don't know what 10% of $4 trillion is. It starts with a four. Uh, 400, no, uh, wow, 400 billion? 400 billion dollars goes to diabetes. <sighs> well, that's a huge problem. Uh, maybe if I shut this, I think. See how many texts I get? My phone calls go crazy. I am a blessed man. Uh, okay. The death rate for diabetes, unlike other chronic conditions, is rising by 1.2% a year. Are you familiar with glitazones? Glitazones are those two medications that came out a decade or two ago, Avandia and, Act uh, Avandia and Actos and Avandia. Yeah, A-C-T-O-S. I don't know if they're still around. They were quite um, heavily marketed you never know with drugs. The FDA approves them, and then you got lawyers calling about them. Um, but both of these drugs, it was fascinating when I studied them. Both had publications that said they killed fungus. Of course they did. If you want to help a diabetic patient, if his diabetes is induced by fungus, you're going to have to use an antifungal. The most logical question right now, I see it in your faces. Why don't you just use Nystatin and Diflucan? I did. I had doctors 30 years ago who said, Doug, this is amazing what you're doing. And I never gave a diabetic patient, I couldn't, I'm not a doctor. I would talk to the doctors and tell them, look, look at, take, take your shoe off, Linda. Look at her toenails. Oh, let's give her Sporanox. Yes. Once we got Sporanox, you saw blood sugar levels stabilizing. You saw beta cells in the pancreas begin to get better, more healthy. Most important, you saw sperm motility increase. I mean, folks, you can't, I never went to help someone with diabetes. I went to help someone with a ringworm all over her body. All you gotta do is take your shoe off, Sporanox. Any doctor will give you Sporanox if you have toenail fungus. This is all of our friends, Martine. After spending 16 years with polycystic ovarian syndrome and five years fertili of, with fertility treatments, I finally got my baby but doctors failed to educate me. Four weeks back on the phase one, and my psycho came back, and I'm fertile. Wow. I got to hear this over, at one time Christy, my wonderful, wonderful assistant for many years, we had a great day. We had seven clients. Doctors, when Dr. Weekly died, uh, I stayed in Dallas. We were gonna go back to California, but the kids were little, they had met kids at school and we didn't want to uproot them and take them back to California so we bought a little place out here and uh, and we stayed here and ironically both boys married girls from this little tiny city that we live in and and they're just wonderful um, but uh, I had so many people who I would talk to the doctors about getting them on antifungals for a skin condition. Now there's one called granuloma annulari. I didn't know what that was. Bumps on the skin, gnarly bumps on the skin. 
uh, seborrheic dermatitis. I, I always called it dandruff, but apparently it's a fungus. And, I, and Dr. Weekly and I got to talk with the guy who invented it. He was a dermatologist, friend of David Weekly's, and I was sitting in David's office and he said, yeah, all I did was took shampoo and put an antifungal in it. I mean, it's so simple and head and shoulder shampoo just literally took off. Um, you're right, Martine, doctors, doctors aren't gonna educate you. God bless them, they don't know. Wouldn't you think, how many doctors do we have in America? I don't know, 150,000? Wouldn't you think we'd go back and take our brightest and best through continuing medical education and say, there's a guy on TV that's scaring us a little bit because he's stupid. He doesn't know, but he thinks fungus causes problems. Let's prove him wrong. Uh, let's put all our patients on Diflucan Nystatin in his diet. And folks, if they do that for three months, Martine, you know what would ensue. I got to see this over and over and over again to the point where I really felt, guys, that God was compelling me to not, I'll never forget, uh, uh, an important person came into Dr. Weekly's office, her husband was on several boards, and she uh, had a, uh, the most serious disease you can have, and we helped her, and she emoted. Uh, two years later, she sent her probably 16, 17 year old daughter in to see me, uh, and every patient, they don't see me, they see the doctor first. Then one of the doctors would come in the room and say, hey Doug, I want to introduce you to, you know, to Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia has a problem and we'd go over the problem. And I would sit down with Cynthia for an hour and I'd say, okay, tell me, when did this start? Yeah, uh, so we had a fire in our home, you know, when I was seven years old. I felt great up to that time. After that fire, you know, we got the house fixed, and I have been sick since. Bingo, water, lots of water. And a builder, folks, not many builders know this. Hug a builder, a contractor who knows this. Um, put the house back together without regard to all the damage done to the wood, not through the fire, but through the water. Then you seal up the wood, fungus eats sugar, and wood sugar is called cellulose. So soon you get fungus growing all over the wood and wham. And I recommended for this young girl the same exact program. I didn't know this because I couldn't remember what I put her mom on. I recommended the same thing for the young girl that I did for her mom. And one day the mom and dad came in and met with me and thanked me. Uh, the girl did great, the mom did great. Uh, and the mom said to me, this was in the 1990s, um, if she got the same thing I got, how many people have this? Good question. Probably 80% of everybody coming in here has it. Um, and she said, why don't you write a book? You have typed out, uh, we didn't have computers back then in the 19, late 80s, early 90s, so I had a word processor and I'd type everything out and give it to them. And she was the one that encouraged the Fungus Link One book uh, that Dr. Holland and I and Dr. Hunt put together. And we didn't know if that book would even sell, so we made 100 copies or something, and boom, you, you know the results. Uh, thanks to the TV show, the radio shows I've done, the interviews I've done, uh, we have uh, all of our books are bestsellers, and I, I kind of felt at that time compelled to not see one child, one adult, or a couple. I've told you about some of those visits, a very prominent orthopedic surgeon out here whose wife had migraine headaches and had compressed her skull. Uh, I'll never forget. Two weeks later, she came back with her husband. I didn't know he was a doctor. And Jim said to me, what are you doing? And I said, ah, I'm trying to help people. Hi, Doug Kaufman. He said, I am I run the orthopedic uh, department at a major hospital out here. We have people in pain all the time. My wife, nothing got rid of her pain. You did it. Can we put some of these patients on my statin? And the rest was history, folks. What these doctors allowed me to do taught me. So I kind of feel, if anything, I'm moved along by the hand of God to, Doug, okay, stop seeing one patient an hour. And we had a guy with prostate disease. Um, he took my wife and I to dinner, the kids, with his wife. And this was in the 
87, 88. And after his prostate disease cleared up, he said, you know a lot. How would you like a radio show? That'd be great. But you see that old Dotson? I'm two months behind the payment on that. I don't have a penny. I'm raising the kids. You know, we're trying our hardest. And uh, he said, no, I'm going to give it to you free. From 6 to 6.30 every Saturday morning, I want you to go in and teach people what you did for me, teach people what you know about nutrition. Humble beginnings. Um, but it was really these giants whom I stood on the shoulders of that make me appear to know a lot. So I began writing books. I had a hypothesis. I had helped people with cancer and thought it may be coincidental, might be coincidental, it might be for real. And then uh, we sat down and we began putting chapters together and the scientific literature was replete with information linking fungus to cancer. Tomorrow, that all culminates in tomorrow. I don't know how many of you guys are churchgoers or in love with the Lord, but when you go to church, it's pretty common to grab hands at some time during the service of people around you, bow your heads, and you say a prayer. I'll see you guys. Say a prayer for me on the way home. <laughs> Um, you say a prayer for a sick, you know, here's, here's Julie and she's got breast cancer and Marvin has prostate cancer and, and you know, it, it's so sad. You're holding, you're in a, you know, please pray for the kids. The kids have health problems. You know, grandpa is very sick. Tomorrow, what's going to happen here? And you get to watch it. I mean, right, John? It's available on uh, God TV. GodTV.com. What I've always thought, and when we used to drive home, you know, when the kids were little, Evan, my handsome big kid now, used to say, Dad, why don't the priests know? Why don't the pastors know about what you do for a living? And I said, I wish they did. Prayers are powerful. I'm telling you, prayers are really powerful, or at least mine are. It's maybe yours are too. Uh, sometimes the answer is no, but you always get an answer back. Imagine someone calling in, hurting, crying like Martine was, um, just giving up. Look, no, no sense. The suicide rate. Oh, no sense in living. I have this handicap. It's gonna, it's gonna define me for the rest of my life. Imagine the pastors and the guys, the team that will be here tomorrow from out of country um, praying for the people calling in. It's going to be broadcast on God TV live. To, if, if you have direct TV, uh, you can get it 2.30 to 4 p.m. tomorrow. I don't know what to expect. I don't have any, uh, no expectation. All I know is Ward, Ward is the CEO, wonderful man you'll get to meet. CEO of, uh, of God TV. Ward has questions for me that people on God TV has asked, have asked him. I've been on God TV since February 4th. March, April, May, June, July. So almost six months. And the feedback has been wonderful. We're the only health show on God TV and it airs in about 300 million global households, 200 countries. Um, so Tomorrow's brand new to me, but here's what's going to happen. They're going, Bennett and you know, these people are going to be here praying for the callers, and I'm going to be the guy that says, infertility, hmm? let's try this. Uh, migraine headaches, hmm? I think God prepped me for this day tomorrow. And then I have major lectures coming up with you know, the truth about cancer and all of these great events that I'm a little guy and they're asking me, a non-doctor, to appear and teach people. If I appear large to that audience is because I stood on the shoulders of giants who enabled me to use antifungal drugs and an experimental diet 45 years ago. We used to call it the phase one, now it's the Kaufman diet. Why do we call it that? Every diet on the internet is now the antifungal diet. We have to differentiate ours from others. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. If you're available tomorrow, Central Time, 
2.30, that's Dallas, uh, 2.30 to 4 p.m. I don't know, I literally don't know where I'll be sitting. I don't know what I'll be wearing. I probably should get a haircut. Um, we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun. We're going to have food here for him, good food and uh, good supplements, and we're going to have some fun. Okay, now you guys want to have some fun too. You have some questions. I love Thursdays because um, that hour and a half seems we can get so much done in that hour and a half that I can't do in an hour anymore. The gift of gab, my wife says. Okay, so John will decide uh, two more of you will get a bottle of this. Please, any and all tummy problems, just take it as directed, okay? Okay. Oh, yeah, okay, Julie, thank you. My YouTube buddy, Julie, have a dear friend whose son is suffering terribly with pandas, P-A-N-D-A-S. I know what you're thinking. That's what I thought years ago. PANDA is an acronym for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Strep Infections. I doubt they are. If they are, then they're antibiotic-induced. You see, if you have a strep bacterial infection, what is a doctor going to prescribe? Not an antibiotic, lots of antibiotics. Aren't antibiotics neurotoxic? In 1945, the medical community first learned that a penicillin was neurotoxic. You know what you tend to do, folks, because there are such benefits to antibiotics, they can save lives. You tend to do, I don't know if you guys had biology or any of the classes I had in high school and college, but do you know what a titer is? If, a lot of nurses watch this show, a lot of lab techs and so forth. A titer is when you take, you remember Tripan Blue? If you got a drop on your skin, it'll be blue for a month. Don't spill it on anything. Uh, so you take a flask and you'd fill it 90% of the way with water. And then you'd take 10 more flasks and you'd fill them with 90% water. And you'd take 10 drops of tri Tripan Blue and you'd fill the first flask. And it would turn just dark blue. Then you'd take 10 drops of that and put it in flask number two. And it's still pretty dark. By the time you get down here to number 10, it looks like water. It's so dilute, it looks like water. Um, folks, what you wanna do is try and titrate these people on the right foods and off the antibiotics. Pediatric autoimmune children. There are 135 autoimmune diseases today. When I was a child, maybe 10. 33 of those are named after doctors. <gasps> yep, got one named after me, not Doug. Total wellness, being 70 years old and working out outside in the sun and then eating a salad is wellness. That's gonna be called Kaufmanism, okay? But for some reason, it's an honor to have a disease named after you, Panda. Pediatric autoimmune. Doctors, doctors are taught that the cells in the body fight with each other, just randomly. Healthy cells put boxing gloves on and start. I don't believe that. I don't believe it for a second. Neuropsychiatric, neurology, all the nerves in the body affecting your, your brain because you have nerves everywhere, but these are affecting the brain, psychiatric disorders, and D for disorders, associated with antibiotics. I know they say associated with strep infections. What does every 100% of doctors use for a strep infection? Now let me ask you this question, Julie. What if he's wrong? What if it isn't a strep infection? Doctors hand out antibiotics like dentists used to hand out bubblegum. Okay, here, take an antibiotic. Um, I'm telling you, I believe, and I've taught a group of DOs, Dr. Osteopathy, this. I believe, thank you, John. Oh, oh, that's great. Oh, this is great. I'll, I'll give you the winners. The notes, the team that works here is just so good. Um, Refractory bacterial conditions. Just dug the end. That was the name of my lecture, as I remember. Uh, refractory infections, those we can't heal. 
And I said, because you're using the wrong medication. Um, and I put up some slides that blew my mind while I was writing this presentation. Uh, just the science that's out there. Instructing doctors, maybe don't use so many antibiotics. Uh, but I don't, I'm sure, you know, my voice fell on deaf ears, as it often does, but at least they heard it. I did the right thing. Um, so if I, Julie, if I had uh, a loved one suffering from PANDA, I'd know that's an acronym. A PANDA is what we call an iatrogenic illness. That means we have no idea what caused it. Iatrogenic is a, a medicine-induced disease. If they're taking antibiotics for a fungal condition, yes, fungus can cause, remember, fungi are neurotoxic. Fungus can cause uh, uh, psychiatric conditions. They do, it's published, depression. Did you know that SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Zoloft, Prozac, they kill fungus and they do a really good job of it. Gee, I wonder why they work for depressed patients. Okay, we can walk down that aisle next time we're together. But if this is an iatrogenic, a hospital or doctor-induced disease, what that means is not shame on them. Folks, they're doing what they learned in medical training, precisely what they're doing. Um, that means that the antibiotics may have worsened this condition. Let me give you an analogy. In 1998, doctors treated 100% of chronic sinusitis with antibiotics. In 1999, the Mayo Clinic published, uh-oh, 96% of all chronic sinusitis is due to fungus. I would love to be sitting here today educating you, telling you that today, thanks to that important paper, 96% of all chronic sinusitis is getting Diflucan and Nystatin. Zero. My guess is 1%. Now, even though the Mayo Clinic, folks, Mayo, mustard, it means nothing. It means nothing. When you've got a license to prescribe chemicals and you're making good money, why would you shoot that goose? Do you have to stay up with the literature? Isn't Mayo Clinic important enough? The analogy is this child, Julie, may have a fungal condition. Did he or she live in a moldy home? Was he or she on antibiotics when they were first born? Let me take it one step further. It seems to be this hunger by our obstetricians to put every woman, test them all for diabetes, big money, test them all for vaginal bacteria. Isn't that kind of normal? Isn't the terrain of the vaginal tract good bacteria and good yeast? Yeah, but bad bacteria. We need to put these mothers on antibiotics. All of a sudden, every mother's on antibiotics. Didn't I just teach that antibiotics are neurotoxic to an unborn fetus? It's sad. When you sit in this chair and do the work I've done, it's a high. Sitting in this chair, having 40 years of experience, uh, not true, 22, 23 years of clinical experience and the rest research, decades. It's cool because sometimes people get you on the phone and you really help them. And that's really exciting. Julie, I would ask the doctor if you could try Nystatin for this child and a Kaufman 1 diet. And I'd have fun with that diet, especially for a child. Kids tend to love sweet drinks. Carrots are really sweet. Green apples add some sweetness to the drink. Man, I would use a little bit of kale, a little bit of spinach. The more green, the better. Fungus hates these things. Uh, I would use, you know, berries. Uh, and I would put together a program, help her, Julie, help her. The greatest thing in the world is that my words fall on your ears. Then your guidance helps someone like this. The laying in bed that first night, you'll emote, you'll cry. We all do. We can't believe that we can help people that doctors can't. That's why I'm really bullish on this uh, uh, ACIM Connect, become a counselor at ACI. I go through the, I, I talked to, was it Roy the other night? Um, 
learn this field, learn health, learn supplements, learn herbs, learn oils, a lot of you guys already do. And then go into a doctor's office, and they'll help you find work. Go into a doctor's office and say, yes, I'm humbly here to see one or two of your patients. Let me tell you, in six months, when you're there on time, looking good, helping their patients, you'll get a huge pay raise. <laughs> I've been part of this. Uh, they cannot believe. Two doctors I worked with in the past, and I worked with lots of them, emoted, cried. They could not believe what they were seeing in these patients coming into our clinic. You will emote too. Julie, if you can use this knowledge to help this little angel, imagine. Okay? Curious, do you know you have any lab? CTCs. Wonder what a CTC is. Uh, hey, Doug, it's your neighbor, Nicole. Um, curious, do you know of any labs that will take CTCs and test them for mold? Um, there's a lab in Richardson, uh, not far from us. Um, Nicole, it's called uh, uh, Real, Real Time Labs. Real Time Labs, they test everything and they use fungal DNA testing. It's really advanced. They can test for mycotoxins. The pathologist that owns it uh, was in the Navy, became a friend of mine, um, and uh, he's a really good guy. Real Time Labs in Richardson. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it is, circulating tumor cells. How'd you know that, John? I looked it up. <laughs> Did you hear that? I looked it up. Uh, curious, do you know any lab that will take circulating tumor cells and test them for mold and fungus? Yep, sure do. Um, okay, so here's Melanie. I was diagnosed with uh, ALL, acute lymphocytic leukemia, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I was diagnosed with ALL or leukemia in April. I've been going through some heavy chemo. Is there a good detox for post-chemo that you'd recommend? Also, would you recommend antifungal meds for a period of time or for the entirety of my treatment, which is going to be about six months? <clears throat> uh, so, Melanie, here's, let me give you a few thoughts here. It's been my experience maybe not all cancers, but leukemia heavily has to do with mold. And uh, I would test your bedroom, your home for mold, especially if you're going through immunosuppressing therapies right now, which you are. Uh, the best detox I can ever tell anyone, try and get the mold out of your body, binding it binding the deposits made by mold, mycotoxins in the gut. Psyllium, P-S-Y-L-L-I-U-M. Psyllium does that. Products like alpha lipoic acid, <clears throat> um, greens. Man, if I were you, I'd be juicing, like I said earlier, with green apples and, and, uh, and, and spinach and ginger, an inch of ginger root in that uh, drink. In other words, it all boils down to this, no matter what you're suffering from out there watching right now. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. This is where doctors are sorely losing. Well, yeah, you've got an ear infection. Okay, I'll treat it. Here's an antibiotic. Doc, can I come back and pay you another 150 bucks? And would you tell me, I get these, as your notes say, six times a year. How do I prevent them? Well, we don't know. Okay. You must change. If you don't change, the doctor's saying, hey, let's see, six times $150. Hmm. They're not like that. They're not like that. They're good people who want to help. But they learned one way in medical school, and I'm telling you, there's two ways. And they learned one of them, okay? And their, their best bet is to do what the pharmaceutical companies taught them, and that's to get you back. They're not, pharmaceutical companies are not bad. My wife always tells me, don't you think every head of every pharmaceutical company in the world has their wife and kids on drugs? They believe in them that much. That's true, that's really a good point. Not bad people, just maybe misguided. I've made it through 70 years and I could probably count on one hand the number of medications and those would be, with the exception of two years ago, 
those would be, you know, before I was a teenager. I just, I, I worry about medicines. Boy, I put something together here. I'm going to, so, uh, yes, get yourself cleaned out, good uh, detox. I would, do you know, um, Melanie, look up Meyer's cocktail. Oh, this was it. Myers Cocktail, Dr. Myers uh, was a physician who put together, I studied this for a long time before I brought it to a, a couple of doctor's offices. This is when you start an IV of, you know, five grams of vitamin C, 25 milligrams of zinc, a uh, few other things, Dr. Myers. And man, did these patients, doctor's patients, that we did these on feel great. Um, you should be absorbing nutrition from the food you eat. But many of us have a barrier so thick in our intestines, we absorb nothing. When you first give, you guys ever take a B12 shot, cyanocobalamin? You take a B12 shot in the hip, one cc. Whew, you get in your car. I've never had one, but I've given them. You get in your car, and people would tell me in the parking lot at the medical building, pull out you know, $1,000 to park for five minutes. Um, and you feel like you're gonna take off. You feel so good. Now here's the fascinating fact. That vitamin should be made by bacteria in the gut. But a loving mom took you to a loving pediatrician when you were three years old for an ear infection and the medication he gave you erased that bacteria. So you don't have B12, the energy vitamin. So you were like this in high school. In college, you just got by with C's and D's. You were always so tired. Yeah, you crave sugar, but that's no big deal. Everybody craves sugar. Um, replenish the bacteria. Get yourself on a good probiotics. And find, Melanie, I don't know where you live, find an ND, a naturopathic doctor. Uh, find uh, someone in the field of nutrition who can say mycotoxin, maybe Berkeley. Uh, find someone who understands that I don't believe it's rare for people who have leukemia to be in a bedroom that has mold growing in it. Yep, remember we talked about endocrine disruption. These things can cause apoptosis. They can pop your good blood cells. Oh, you've got leukemia, okay? I'm not saying you don't. I'm saying change. Interaction. So I did this study. Um, so I said baflomycin, streptozotocin, or tacrolimus is the newer drug that is a mycotoxin that lowers the person's immune system when they get a liver transplant, for example. You want the person's immune system lowered till that new person's liver can catch up with them, right? You save lives with these mycotoxins that horribly lower your immune system, and then at some time, your immune system bounces back. Uh, and I did a study, listen to this, this, where did this come out of? This was a big website, maybe I have it in here. Diabetes, penicillins may cause false positive results on urine sugar tests for diabetes. People with diabetes should check with a physician to see if they need to change their diet or the dose of their diabetic, med diabetic medicine. First sentence, penicillins, and there's a hundred of them, Penicillins may cause false positive urine diabetes tests. Shh, it's working. <laughs> but get this, John, you didn't, okay, ready? Ready for this one? You and I didn't, we didn't know this. Interactions for penicillin. Birth control pills may not work when taken at the same time as penicillin. Of course, all of the women on birth control pills have heard that from their doctors. No. Birth, do you think that's an important one? Did we not talk about mycotoxins being in interfering with fertility? I mean, wow. And penicillin is a mycotoxin. To prevent pregnancy, use additional methods of birth control pill, uh, birth control while using uh, penicillin. Penicillins may interact with many other medicines. When this happens, 
the effects of one or both of the drugs may change, uh, or the risk or side effects of each medication may be greater. What? I mean, why would you have to watch this show in the middle of the day to get this information? Every physician is duty bound, duty bound. I mean, don't, please, don't get me started. Okay, now back to your questions. And again, folks, I'm not a doctor. I'll try and answer these as best I can. Based on the so many people I sat down with, Okay, good. Uh, Debbie, and let's see. Okay, good. We got, we got that. Okay, here's who won the. Uh... Okay, so, uh, Aloe Apex giveaway. Sonia, I'm prone to C diff. I would be interested in the bottle. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sonia. It's going to be coming your way. Dasha, I would love to try the Aloe Apex. I've had 50 surgeries. Grew up on so many antibiotics. Recently put cancer in remission, but still struggle with mold toxicity and Lyme's disease with three co-infections. Dasha, I'm so excited to send you off a bottle of this. And Sonia, you too. If you two would just uh, give us your mailing address. It can be a P.O. box. I'm going to send them out. Um, live at Know the Cause. Live at Know the Cause. I didn't know you could roll in. I thought that was just TV, John. You can do that on this too? Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, yeah, both. Congratulations to you. I want, this would be good for Sarge, too, if he starts getting feedback. Dasha's always been so good at giving us feedback on everything she does here. Um, so, Debbie, okay. Yo, Doug. <laughs> My husband wants to know if there is a second best time to take psyllium with eight ounces of water uh, if he does it at bedtime. He would like to take it several times a night. Uh, he would, oh. If he does, oh, I got you, I got you, Debbie. If he does at bedtime with eight ounces of water, he'd be up several times a night, probably urinating. He's drinking a lot of water before he goes to bed. Um, uh, listen, um, this is a non-discriminatory product. If you take it in, there is an herb called Cascara Sagrada. Cascara Sagrada. You can get it in any health food store. Not many people know about it. I used to recommend it as what I called a blasting cap. If your bowels haven't moved in five days, you want a little bottle of Cascara Sagrada. Poop Doc also has a magnesium, a unique magnesium that does the same thing. It's probably cheaper than Cascara Sagrada, but my old days of working clinically, I used to recommend, you know, people come in and say, you know, my bowel hasn't worked in two weeks. Alrighty then, you probably need Cascara Sagrada, and it worked. Um, psyllium, if you take psyllium before you go to bed, it doesn't mean you wake up at seven o'clock and run in the bathroom, right? Not anything like that. Psyllium gently binds. Psyllium is what we call a non-digestible fiber, okay? Here, here's a digestible fiber. This is a fake one so you don't really want to eat it. Um, I had one yesterday on the drive home. Um, this is digestible fiber. What's the difference? Digestible fiber, what goes in must come out. We Americans eat too few fiber, too little fiber or fiber products in our lives. If you're eating cereal and pasta, if you're eating dead foods, um, then you probably need much more fiber in your diet. Psyllium is good for people who do eat fast foods, a lot of hamburgers, pizzas, you know. And look, I, my wife and I raised two boys. We know what it's like to be <laughs> totally out of money and stopping at a hamburger for the kids. We, we know what that's like. Um, just ask your kids then, before they go to bed, to shake up a little psyllium or not. Psyllium can be taken at, in the morning. Psyllium can be taken at noon. Um, I always tell people that its action works best off of food. So in the morning, after you eat, maybe 10 o'clock, shake up a little psyllium at work, shoot it down, and away you go. Um, so non-digestible fiber, what goes in must come out. But what it does 
is bind to these poisons in the gut from wheat and pasta and breads and so forth, if you have them. It binds to these mycotoxins and then it assists you in eliminating. And uh, you, Debbie, most people find if they're really backed up that it takes, if you're using poop doc, you can get more information on our website, we have an advertiser, uh, just go to our website, knowthecause.com and look up poop doc. Um, if you are on his product, it goes much quicker, two days. If you use other fibers, which I've recommended for a long time in Cascara Sagrada and other fiber sources, it can take up to five days. Um, so, um, yeah, he can take it at absolutely any time. It doesn't have to be in the evening before he goes to bed. It's a good question. Okay, so my brother was recently diagnosed with prostate cancer. Kathy, I'm sorry. One doctor wanted to start radical treatment, but another says no. Treatment was likely to kill him. He's 85. Wow. He said it was a slow-moving type. Can you recommend any fungal-wise doctors live in the villages in Florida? Man, that's such a pretty state. My friend, uh, Mark Sisson, who I talked with the other day, Mark's big in the paleo movement. Uh, Mark... Uh, you may have read, sold his business, uh, Paleo, uh, or uh, what was his, uh, what was it? Primal. Primal, thank you, John. Primal Nutrition to Kraft uh, for a huge amount of money. But he moved from Malibu to Florida, and he really likes Florida. Um, was, the tax situation is so much different there than in California. Florida, every time I go there, I just fall in love with it. Um, okay, Kathy... Doctor number two gets my vote. Watchful waiting. Uh, you know what my topic is for my lecture at TTAC? There's going to be this huge numbers of people. Um, what is cancer? Ty and Charlene you know, said, what's the topic? Why don't we start with what is cancer? Because the medical community has a thousand answers. There's not cancer. There's a hundred kinds of cancer. Really? Um, so my topic is going to be, what is cancer? I'm a guy who doesn't go to a doctor, okay? Um, how would I know if I had prostate cancer? Well, I've worked with men with prostate cancer, and they tell me one was a trucker who drove cross country. As a matter of fact, from the middle of America, Houston to L.A. and back, and then Houston to L.A. and back, and back, back. And he said his... Uh, prostate got so sore. Okay, so ladies, the prostate is a little tiny walnut gland through which the male urine tube passes right through, the urethra passes right through it. So when this little guy starts swelling, inflammation, it clamps down on the urine tube. And so we dribble. We no longer have this great stream when we go to the bathroom. We just dribble or drip. Um, and uh, this guy told me that he literally couldn't sit anymore. He had to get a donut to sit hit his rear end, and then his legs got so sore, and he had prostate disease. I believe that men are so... How do I say this? Getting up at night urinating does not mean you have prostate cancer. Um, if it does then those two little boys you saw at the opening of today's show, the little one is still in diapers. And one morning he got up, one Saturday morning they were at our house. And he came, <laughs> absolutely the cutest kids in the world. I am dying laughing. His diapers and his pajamas are down around the middle. You know, he comes walking in. That diaper had to have weighed seven pounds, filled with urine. So if nighttime urination is a prerequisite for prostate disease, then that little boy has a prostate this size and it isn't working. I just get, folks, we got to sell you. Urologists have to sell you. Um, my take home message, Kathy, is what made this tissue inflamed? Did you guys know two things? Number one, C-reactive protein is a blood test that doctors draw to test for inflammation inside the body. Systemic fungal reactions cause a high CRP, 
I don't think many doctors know that. Good people, I don't think they know that because fungus is as far removed as you can imagine. So you have to under, and, and second, what makes bread rise? I know this isn't a prostate, but what makes bread rise? It's really fascinating, folks, really fascinating. That same yeast makes your prostate. Wow, that's weird. One of my breasts seems larger than the others. What makes bread rise? Wow, what did you eat last night? Look at your belly, it's hanging. What makes bread rise? You know, sometimes my left eye, I can hardly see a thing, and it's dangerous. I get on the freeway, I'm telling you this, uh, this isn't me, uh, but I've heard it. I can hardly see, and I have to look through both eyes, and I try and rub this eye. What makes eyeballs inflamed? What makes bread rise? What can induce glaucoma? Isn't it weird that they put an ocular pressure gauge on your eyeball, and they say, yep, you got glaucoma. Why do you say that? Because you got pressure in the eye. Fungi love vitreous humor. That's the liquid in the eyeball. It's hot tubs. They're sitting back there like this, enjoying the bubbling going on in your eye. Um, if doctors ever picked this up, folks, it would be a breakthrough. Catherine, most doctors would agree that at 85 years old, doing nothing is the best thing. But can I interject? At 85 years old, doing nothing surgically or medically intervention, I would agree. I'm not him. He gets to choose, and you can help him um, choose whatever you decide. But I got to tell you, let me go back to where I was half an hour ago. If you always do what you've always done, <clears throat> you'll always get what you've always gotten. For 85 years, something has been swelling and swelling and swelling, and it's culminated. They say, I read a fascinating article in the paper yesterday that said uh, the aging process is just atherosclerosis because we're all going to have clogged arteries. We're all going to have prostatitis. We're all going to have breast cancer or cervical cancer. We're all going down that road. So, you see, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I think if we watch TV and follow the cereal ads or the booze ads or the drug ads, I say, okay. I'm, I'm totally into that, <clears throat> but I don't. I so much respect if that's the way you want to go. I think that's awesome. Um, but just give me my say, because I worked with so many people who were on lots of drugs, and we helped them tighter down. The doctors did. Okay, so, uh, John, thank you so much for this. Do you have that clip, John, perhaps? Could we show that on YouTube, Facebook? You don't. No, no, that's okay. <clears throat> we met this. Uh, we met this doctor. Uh, uh, John is so great. John and Clay, two of the producers, they went with me last year to Florida, and they had their camera going. And doctors, you know, Joe Mercola was there, and all these alternative doctors. Man, we had fun. And I got up on the podium and I said, "Listen, we got a couple of cameramen with you. The show is big." Uh, if you'd like to impart knowledge on our viewers, they would probably love that too. And man, they came out. When my lecture was done, there was a line of people waiting to ask me questions. And, um, and this Dr. Uh, Rapol, R-I-P-O-L-L. John, what was it? She was talking about the sexual transmission? Yes. Uh, what was she talking about? Are, are we passing it back and forth? Did you ask her that, John? She's a urologist and an oncologist. And man, she was a pistol. Her practice is in Boca Raton, Florida. Her name is Amelia Rapol, R-I-P-O-L-L. -L. She's an MD. Her URL, her uh, website is Doctors Studio, plural, doctorsstudio.com. Um, and John, John asked her, and, and what a pistol she was. Doctor, do you think we're passing this? Do you have the woman's book yet? It's a touchy subject, folks. You're not going to find that in any book. Um, are you passing this back and forth? One of the chapters, I think chapter three or four. Every Women, gosh, I've known so many. Women go to their doctors and say, you know what, doctor? 
I get a yeast infection or a bladder infection every time we're intimate. Well, it's just coincidental. Okay. And I say in that book, but if the doctor is a female doctor, she'll totally get it because she's been there. But a male doctor, like we could cause you to have problems. Pretty certain. The more I read in that chapter, it fascinated me. It fascinated me that nobody knows our brightest and best Zoom. And yet, here's what they found. In this book, well, Clinical Mycology, you've seen that big green book. In that book, in chapter 10, they have fungus of the urinary tract. And a subcategory in that chapter on fungal prostatitis. The opening sentence, the most commonly the most common fungi infecting the male prostate is candida albicans. Isn't that vaginal yeast infections? Yeah. Oh, it's just coincidental. What? Remember what I just taught you? Here's the prostate, there's the urine tube. And during a loving, good relationship we have with our spouse, that guy's open. And something's gonna travel up that urine tube and stop at that prostate where there's good sugars. And it's gonna live there. And slowly, Catherine, Catherine, slowly, 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 that prostate gets a little larger and a little larger and a little larger. Here's what bothers me. Men go in at 50 years old. They finally have got some money saved up. They love their kids and their wife. And they got to get a life insurance policy, $500,000 policy. And some nurse will come to their home and draw their blood, and they'll go do the blood test, um, or they'll go do the insurance write-up. And soon that blood test will come back denied. Why? Because your PSA normal is 0 to 4, 4.0. Your uh, PSA was 6.0. We're worried about your prostate. Wow, I should worry too. There isn't a urologist in the world who would agree with me on this. I just need you to know. The good news is Dr. Uh, the guy who invented the PSA test wrote a book on it. It's called The Great Prostate Hoax. How medicine stepped in and made... Do you have that camera, John? Or are we on? Yeah, there you go. The Great Prostate Hoax. This book was a no-put-down for me. I interviewed the doctor in 1970. Man, that's a war. That's the year I was in Vietnam. He wrote this book. How big medicine hijacked the PSA test and caused a public health disaster. I do not believe all these 50-year-old men have prostate cancer. I believe that they drink alcohol. I believe they take antibiotics. And I believe both of those can give false readings. Didn't we just hear? Didn't we just read about diabetes and penicillin? Shh. If I was a woman getting a pap smear, I would be off of all alcohol and uh, all antibiotics for five days before I went in. Because I think they can give you false positive readings. If I was a man, if I was a man, <laughs> if I was a man, this is what I would do. I haven't been to a urologist, you know? Um, so I don't know what I do, but I definitely wouldn't be on antibiotics and I definitely wouldn't be on alcohol for five days. Um, and i just not going to go, you know, that's that simple. So I hope that helps, uh, Catherine. Um, just look, keep, keep the guy in your prayers. 85, he's had a good run. He's had a good run. Can he live longer? Watchful waiting is what they call good. I'm 50% of the way there with him. Intervention at 85, I don't know the case, but... I probably would say no. But what they're expecting, Catherine, is, well, he's going to die in the next six months or year anyway. What? And if he does nothing, who knows? But if he does something, at 85, are you too old to get a champion juicer? Are you too old to learn about essential oils, transdermally essential oils? Are you too old to get the bowel moving a couple times a day? Are you too old to do, you know, stretches, weights, 10-pound weights, building new muscle tissue? 
Are you too old to ride a bike? A healthy lifestyle dictates that you look at everything in your lifestyle differently. Remember, there is genetics, and this is why I will never give a swab to these genetic companies, because there's also epigenetics. Genetics says you are the hand you were dealt. Well, mom and dad gave you a pretty bad hand because grandma died of diabetes, grandpa died of heart disease, dad died of heart disease, mom died of cancer. Boy, Doug, you got a bad, that sperm and egg became Doug. Epigenetics, epi means on or upon. On your DNA are marker, are, are signals that you can activate. Remember the key we always talk about? You own that key. God gave you that key. Few people use it, but it unlocks a treasure trove of information. Epigenetics is why I started when dad was sick. He lost his leg to, God, I don't even want to go into it because some doctors told him that um, he needed to lose his leg. Um, when I was in Vietnam, 1970, uh, he lost his leg at Kaiser Hospital. Oh. Okay, so at any rate, um, I came home from Vietnam. I'm brand new at all this. Dad lost his leg. Yeah, Doug, you need to start getting to doctors also. You know, you might lose your leg. It's like the woman who's told Grandma had breast cancer, you start getting to, you know, to a doctor and getting mammograms done all the time. Really? Because that's old hat. That's old school. That's genetics. And I'm not saying that 5 to 10% of the time, this book, the breast book uh, by Dr. Susan Love, great book. Cancer isn't genetics. So when I get up before the truth about cancer, every woman's told, every doctor's taught to tell every woman by the drug companies. Every woman's told, oh, yeah, if mom had, you need to get in here every year at least for a mammogram. Really? Is there anything I can do? No, no. Yeah, there is. It's called epigenetics. When I saw dad without that leg when I came home from Vietnam, it blew me away. And I took him to the doctor a couple of times. And, uh, you know, you a son, hey, how are you? Nice people, shook his hand. Um, you need to be vigilant. You know, you may have cancer yourself. Um, I never thought Dad had cancer. I still don't to this day. Um, but think about with your brother, Catherine, epigenetics. I think he may be able to go another 10, 15 years if he changes his lifestyle. Having said that, Catherine, I'm 70, just about. Um, 15 years from now, I might be kind of tired. You know, maybe. Going home doesn't sound so bad. Is he right with a man upstairs? Maybe going home isn't such a bad thing. But I'll probably be exercising, God willing, on my 85th birthday. I hope I'm still here teaching all of this. Uh, need advice on what husband can take right now? He is cancer-free from test. Doctor might not give him drugs. Suggestions for over-the-counter. Uh, John, what's wrong with him? Do you know? Uh, that's Gail. Okay, so let me, uh, Gail, generally. We now know, oh, a couple of these I was going to read you. We now know that resveratrol, what makes purple grapes purple, is a potent antifungal. A potent antifungal. We know that caprylic acid, lauric acid, we know that neem, the Ayurvedic Indian uh, herb, all herbs, amino acids. We know that these things are antifungal. We know, Gail, that if you can't get prescriptive antifungals, we know that taking vitamin C, taking B vitamins, antifungal, um, is it, a very good thing. So I would just rotate every couple of weeks a different antifungal. I love resveratrol. Uh, I love caprylic acid. <clears throat> My friend, by the way, do you guys know, you're asking a lot of cancer questions, do you know beta-glucan? Beta-glucan is soon to go global also, this one company that does all the medical school research. Um, get some free beta-glucan. You get 10 days worth of the big NSC 100. Um, just go to my website and look up uh, nsc24.com. Frank Jordan, go to my website 
and look up Frank Jordan. Watch five minutes of what he's talking about and he'll send you a packet. He pays for the postage. And take one of those a day for 10 days. Watch what happens. If I had cancer, I'd be on that like white is on rice. Um, I really would. So I hope that helps. Uh, Mo says, is fungus the cause of type 1 diabetes? It is in guinea pigs. Type 1 diabetes, anybody know what it used to be called? Right, juvenile diabetes. But then we got 70-year-old guys getting diabetes. I'm sure as long as there's antibiotics, as long as there's alcohol, there's going to be a lot of diabetes going around. Um, Um, okay. Okay, so this, I'm, I'm not going to be good on this, Jeanette. I have very low TSH. Uh, TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. And here's the wisdom of medicine. If your TSH is very low, you have hyperthyroid. <clears throat> if it's high, you have hypothyroid. Couldn't they get that right? We, we talk about medicine being so behind, John, and then my battery box, <laughs> my batteries quit. I'm sorry, John. Yeah. I like, um, gosh, there's so many good formulas. Uh, uh, life Extension. Uh, life Extension has some of the greatest thyroid products. Look, here's what I love, Mo. About, or I'm sorry, Jeanette, here's what I love about Life Extension. I went upstairs when we were in Florida, we were interviewing their doctors, and upstairs they must have 50 nutritionists on the phone talking to people. Uh, another thing I like about it, my friend who has my email address told me that she called, told the people there about her husband's health problems. She said, I probably talked for 20 minutes, and the man on the phone said, I doubt that's the problem. Um, why don't you do this with his diet first? And she emailed me and said it worked. Um, so that's who Life Extension is. They've been around 40 years. Great company. Uh, if I, this would be a great question for one of their nutritionists. Um, Jeanette, I'll never forget listening to a doctor lecture. This was in Texas maybe 20, 15, 20 years ago. He was lecturing on thyroid, and I'm telling you, I'm one of the people in the audience that fell asleep. Nobody has a handle on thyroid. So I want to end today the way I began today. Those two little words, endocrine disruption. That is thyroid disease. There, according to this same book, Clinical Mycology, there is no human tissue that fungus can't impregnate, including the thyroid and parathyroid, except the teeth. No human tissue. Eyeballs, brains, lips, everywhere. Fingernails. Well, we know that. Onychomycosis is fingernail fungus. Since doctors aren't trained in mycology, they aren't educated this way. Thank you, John. They aren't educated this way. Um, nobody's going to recommend when you have a thyroid problem, endocrine disruption induced by mycotoxins. And so I'll eat my corn, and I'll eat my peanuts, 
and I'll have my drink, my glass of wine, and I'll never put one and one together because my doctor doesn't. Because my doctor eats the corn, eats the wheat, whole wheat, by the way, only whole wheat, uh, drinks the beer, etc. Not bad people. They, they missed the most important class in their medical training. Why is that? On TV, I brought you several times stories about how um, medical school students are subjected to lectures from the pharmaceutical industry. So they send over a PhD to lecture on statin drugs. So if you have high cholesterol, you need our medication. And I'd put people on it, and these young, impressionable minds, brilliant minds, are hearing stodgy dudes talk about our medication. I'm just not a guy who thinks statin drugs have saved the millions of lives that they are. Prove it to me. I have a high cholesterol. I made it to 70. Maybe I'll make it to 80. But I do things a little bit differently. And Catherine, I hope that's where you'll be able to talk to your brother and say, I'm going to be here. I'll never. Do you remember uh, Bill? Remember who had lung cancer, John? And I used to go for my run. This is 10, 15 years ago. Go for my three-mile run. Then I'd drive over to Bill's house, who lived over the hill. His granddaughter married my son. And knock on his door, and he'd get his shoes on. And the first two months, we walked, and he'd spit out this stuff. And uh, finally, we got him up to a light jog. And then that one day, he came in the studio when we were closed, and he had the report from his doctor that he didn't have lung cancer. Very, very exciting time for all of us. Um, and Bill was 82. Can you do it? That's all. Okay, uh, Georgios uh, Ari. Can blepharitis be caused by fungus? Yeah. Uh, it was Dr. Everett Hughes. I was working at USC Medical School when I got back from Vietnam. He went to Dr. Howard Gottschalk's office. They became friends. And they were looking to do food allergy tests. And I... Uh, took off to the Washington University School of Medicine. They trained me in blood testing for food allergy. And so I got, to, uh, I got to meet Dr. Hughes, and we did a couple of research papers together. One of his papers he did, I wasn't on this one, was blepharospasms, are they food-induced? So blepharitis, remember the suffix itis, to a doctor it means antibiotics. What it really means is inflammation. And doctors just hand out antibiotics for inflammation. Um, yes, uh, can blepharitis be due to fungus? You bet it can. And my money would be on maybe most times it is. You see, we have learned the dangers of robotically handing antibiotics to people. They induce bad diseases down the line, and they can induce antibiotic resistance very quickly. But who said Nystatin never caused any problems? Who said, Georgios, that a changed diet ever caused any problem? Who said swallowing a gram or two of vitamin C a day ever caused any problems? You're going to know in 30 days on the Kaufman One Diet whether your problem, and it's not spasms, I know it's itis, inflammation, are linked to fungus or not. Your doctor may never, but you can. You starve the fungus with the Kaufman One Diet. Was this fun? Wasn't this great? God bless you guys. If you have the opportunity and you want to have a little fun, tomorrow at 2.30 to 4, go to GodTV.com. Ward Simpson, the CEO of God TV, will be sitting on one of these sets uh, with me. You know, might even put a necktie on for you guys. Thank you so much for joining me today, and congratulations to Gail. Nope. Congratulations to Sonia and Dasha. Glad you won. I'll get these in the mail. God bless. Bye-bye.